This is the Samsung Odyssey G7. Hold on a minute. This is the AOC C24G1. It's 24 inches, it's curved, it's got a 144Hz 1080p VA panel, and it's the cheapest high refresh rate monitor on Amazon at $145. But don't think that just because it's the cheapest, it's bad. Because, well, first of all, when you compare it to the monitors I've recently reviewed, it is bad. But for the buck, you're getting a lot of bang. Let's start with some of the basic stuff. It's 23.6 inches, which makes it ideal for competitive use on a budget. It has a 1080p resolution with a pixel density of 93 pixels per inch, so it's pretty hard to pixel peep, at least that's what I thought until I actually started using the monitor. Despite the pretty high pixel density, for some reason there is this weird grainy effect on edges of not just text, which is what I thought it was limited to when I first looked at it, but pretty much anything with an edge, such as these icons. And to make matters worse, there's not even a sharpness feature on the monitor to make any adjustments. But that's where the negatives end for the display basics. It has a 1500R curve, which personally I'm not too crazy about. It has FreeSync Premium, a peak brightness of 238 nits with the monitor's contrast setting set to 50, which is the default setting and the best setting for this monitor, otherwise it'll look weird. And speaking of contrast, because it has a VA panel, it has a fantastic contrast ratio of 3062 to 1, meaning that blacks will be black and not gray like they do on your typical IPS and TN panels. It also does well with gamut coverage and color accuracy, covering 95% of the sRGB color space, which is perfectly fine, but that's where the find ends because it only covers 69% of Adobe RGB, nice, and 72% of the P3 color space. Color accuracy fares much better both pre and post calibration. If you're the average buyer who just buys a monitor and does not get it professionally calibrated, which is the majority of you, you'll be 100% fine with its uncalibrated average delta E of 2.55, which was right out of the box with no settings changed. For those that don't know how Delta E works, the closer you are to zero, the more accurate you are with zero being 100% perfect and five or more being just horrible. With 2.55, it's very difficult for the untrained eye to notice any inaccuracies, so this is good. Just keep in mind, all panels are made with different manufacturing tolerances, so your panel may be better or worse than mine. When calibrated though, you get much better results producing an outstanding average delta E of 0.57, so it'll look perfect to the human eye. Viewing angles are also good being that this is a VA panel. It's no IPS panel, but it does way better than any TM panel ever would, doing okay directly from the sides and the top, which makes it look like you increase the contrast just a bit more than you should, but doing better on the bottom, lowering the contrast effect. Now I doubt you or anyone would be looking at this directly from the side or the top, so when it comes to a more realistic scenario, like say a 45 degree angle, the higher contrast effect is almost non-existent, so you can view this at a decent angle without any angle discoloration. Now if you watched my Samsung Odyssey review, you most likely remember me talking about the two main issues with having a VA panel, response time and backlight bleed. So let's see how the AOC does. It has six levels of overdrive, off, weak, medium, strong, Boost, which is ELMB, or Extreme Low Motion Blur, and MBR, which stands for Motion Blur Reduction, but we'll get to that. Now, I'm not gonna lie, being that this is not only a VA panel, but is super cheap, I expected it to fail miserably. But it turns out that when the overdrive is off, it does pretty well. And when you compare it to something like the ASUS VG259QM at 120Hz at its best overdrive setting, which, by the way, guys, if you don't already know, that is a beastly 240Hz IPS monitor. Anyway, the AOC doesn't do quite as good, but it isn't bad at all considering the price difference. But it only gets better from here, because if we move to weak, you get slight improvements with a little less ghosting, medium lowers it more, and strong lowers it even further, beating the ASUS without any compromises. Are you serious right now? And yes, as I mentioned earlier, this monitor has ELMB, and it does look fantastic, beating the ASUS again, however, there's a huge drawback with this monitor's ELMB in particular. Number one is the obvious one, where it uses the backlight strobing technique which can give users a headache. But the even bigger problem here is the peak brightness. See, when you enable ELMB on most monitors, it usually halves a monitor's peak brightness. The ASUS, for example, goes from 415 nits to 207 nits. But the AOC's peak brightness goes from 238 nits and gets cut into 1 4th that to 64 nits, which is so dark I can't recommend using it. You can remedy this though by using the motion blur reduction or MBR function instead, which lets you choose how much brightness you want to sacrifice for a specific amount of blur reduction, which is very nice and surprising that more monitors don't include this. I found 10 MBR to be a nice balance, lowering a good amount of blur without lowering the brightness too much, 
keeping it at a peak of 126 nits. Now, 126 nits may not be ideal for plenty of games and gamers, so I recommend the Strong Overdrive if you're not keen on using the ELMB or MBR functions. And lastly, if you're a console peasant and want to know what 60Hz looks like, here you go. The medium setting was the best, and when you compare it to the ASUS, it was just slightly worse, so it's a good panel overall. If you want to see more results, you can visit my website in the video description. It's still under construction, but I try to post more information there that I don't post here for the sake of your attention. Next is Backlight Bleed, and surprisingly, that isn't bad either. Before we get to that though, just remember that this will vary from panel to panel, so you will get different results than me. I'll start with zero brightness and increase it by 10 every second or so. Backlight Bleed is there? though barely visible, but that's probably because of the limited peak brightness. Regardless, I haven't been able to notice it when watching things in dark situations, and if you had my panel, you definitely won't be complaining. Now one thing I do want to point out is that smearing was super noticeable and ugly when smooth scrolling, but only with grey backgrounds. It was a non-issue with white or black backgrounds. And speaking of dark situations, how good is the black equalizer on this? We'll start with the most extreme example, which is Escape from Tarkov. With the black equalizer set to 50 out of 100, which is the default, it looks pretty dark which is the result of the VA panel's super high contrast ratio, making those blacks actually black instead of grey like with TN or IPS panels. Here's the ASUS with its black equalizer off as it dominates with its lower 1001 contrast ratio. Increasing the black equalizer to 60 makes it brighter, but not in a black equalizer sense. See, a black equalizer is supposed to only alter the gamma of black and grey shades of color, like this ASUS for example black equalizer off, black equalizer on. But what it seems like it's happening here is that it's trying to equalize the blacks by adding some sort of brightness filter over the screen rather than changing the gamma. This is more obvious when we move to 70, then 80, then 90, and then 100, which just makes it look like you're looking through an empty fish tank full of dirty water. The best option here is 60, which brightens up the image without making the image look like garbage. The AOC also has a color vibrance function which lets you add color when needed, such as now. Now let's move on to Rainbow Six Siege. With the black equalizer off, again, it looks dark with a lot of depth and increasing it to 60 gives more brightness, making it much easier to see. But again, 70, 80, 90, and 100 puts us in the same situation as before where it just looks like a white filter. The good thing about this black equalizer though is that in games like CSGO, Valorant, or in this case, Siege, it works well and when you crank the color vibrance up, it's actually comparable to some other monitors with a decent black equalizer. Next, let's talk about the design of this thing. The design is very gamer-esque, and you can tell as soon as you look at it. You have sharp spread out legs that look like blades, the back of the monitor is just a boring slab of black plastic with some red trim, and is made with the same plastics most monitors are made of. It has very thin top and side bezels at 7mm thick, as well as a very thin chin at 2cm thick. The legs themselves spread out 17 inches wide, and from the back of the stand to the front, it's only 9 inches and 3 quarters so it has a very wide and short footprint, kind of like a chip. The OSD or on-screen display is also pretty good. You have four buttons that allow you to navigate through the OSD, as well as acting as shortcut buttons when you don't have the OSD pulled up. The left button is your quick source selection. Next to that lets you access your game mode or color profiles. Next to that you can access your quick crosshair, and the last one brings up the full OSD. The OSD that this monitor uses is logically laid out. First is the luminance menu, which lets you adjust your typical display stuff such as your contrast, brightness, eco mode, which are your presets for your contrast and your brightness, you have gamma, you have DCR or dynamic contrast ratio, which locks you from being able to control anything. Next is color setup, which allows you to adjust your color temperatures. Nothing more to that. Then you have picture boost, which allows you to brighten up your screen if needed, but it does add another filter on top of whatever you're looking at, kind of like the black equalizer. Another issue is that the frame size, which starts at 14, is the default and every time you go to 100 or whatever you do, you turn it off and you turn it back on, it defaults back to 14, so it's a pain to use if you're trying to use this for whatever reason. And lastly you have your game settings, which allows you to change your game mode that I mentioned earlier in the shortcuts, which is basically your color and setting presets. You can adjust your shadow control, which is your black equalizer, game color, which is your color vibrance, low blue light, overdrive, free sync, FPS counter, and your adjustable MBR or motion blur reduction. Overall, it's fine and easy to use, and anytime you're in a particular game mode, whatever changes you've made on that game mode will be saved automatically, so you can easily switch between your content consumption mode and your gaming mode when you switch tasks. Which 
is kind of sad that this $145 monitor does better in this aspect than a lot of other monitors that's even twice the cost. This also comes with a good amount of small details, such as 100x100 100 100 VESA mounting support, so you can mount this to a monitor arm or stand. It has a wire routing hole so you can organize your wires instead of having this mess. You have tilt, height, swivel, but no pivot, though that won't be an issue if you're using a monitor arm or stand. And you have a decent assortment of I.O. with two HDMI 1.4 ports, a DisplayPort 1.2 port, a VGA port in case you're still rocking that, and a headphone jack. And even though that's all this includes for creature comforts, remember, this is only $145. Other than the smearing and the graininess on text and edges, I have no complaints. And lastly, what's it like to use this monitor? Well, it's almost like any other 1080p 24-inch monitor, but with a little more benefits. It's bright enough so you'll be able to enjoy doing whatever you want to do, content looks fine and can deliver pleasing highlights because of its high contrast ratio, even though it doesn't support HDR, which was also further helped by its good color calibration out of the box, and even though this suffers slightly from that weird grain looking effect, that doesn't seem to be an issue when watching content, whether it's high or low resolution videos, or even when playing games. It mainly just happens with stationary pixels, but text in those situations will still look the same. Size-wise, it is a bit small, but that's not really an issue for me. If you have the real estate, just pull the monitor closer to you and it'll give you the same effect of buying a bigger monitor. I'd rather deal with that than having a monitor too big that I can't push further. So in conclusion, is the AOC C24G1 worth picking up and is it worth your $145 doll hairs? Well, if you're on a budget and you want something to help you hand out free haircuts all day, this is an absolute beast and a steal for the price. Now, if you spend an extra $50, you can probably get much better but if you're the person who started with a budget of $100 or $120 and stretch it out to this price range, you'll be super happy with this, especially if you've never experienced a high refresh rate life. It's got all the ingredients of being a good gaming monitor, at least 144Hz, a decent enough black equalizer, color vibrance, awesome ghosting, and great gamut coverage and color reproduction for your average daily content consumption, and when you combine all of these together, you have a great cheap monitor. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you guys enjoyed it, please leave a like. If you disliked it, leave a dislike. It helps me anyways. Subscribe, you know the drill, all that stuff. Remember to check out my website if you guys want to see all the results. And if you want to buy this monitor, click on the Amazon links in the video description. Other than that, have a great day, every day. Peace.